Our greatest problem, mankind's greatest problem. I know Greg uh, last Wednesday uh, touched on sin, and, and so has uh, Derek. Sunday he touched on sin. If these sheets that's in the back, make sure you get a copy of each one because there's two different sets of sheets, if you will, if you'll get those. And we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the verse that I was given, and what I'm going to do is I, I printed out some verses so I can go through them. Because I'm going to have to go through them really quick because there's a lot of verses that I want us to cover. And so you can flip with me if you want. Um, but uh, the verses that I was given is Matthew chapter 5. So we'll go to that one first. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 through 30. Uh, some of this, a lot of this material I got from a book called Studying Sin Seriously. And that's by Wendell Winkler. And it's a very good book. If you, uh, you can get it and need uh, to find out how to get it let me know uh, it's a very good book and uh, it, it really goes over a lot of stuff dealing with sin but if we turn to Matthew chapter 5 verse 29 through 30 it says now if your right eye is causing you to sin tear it out throw it away from you for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell and if your right hand is causing you to sin cut it off and throw it away from you for it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go to hell, um, going to hell. I know that Jesus, as he's speaking, he's not actually telling us to go and pluck our eye out or cut our hand off. Even though, I will say this, Jesus taught the truth. And you know what? In order, if it, <laughs> something that's hindering us from going to, to heaven and be with God it would be better for us to cut our hand off if that made a, a, a difference in us going to heaven or hell and plucking our eye out. So he's showing us the severity and the seriousness of sin. Uh, it is our greatest problem. It is man's greatest problem. It's the thing that actually sent our Lord and Savior to the cross. That's how serious it is. And I think a lot of times we, uh, we have a tendency to overlook sin. We have a tendency to get complacent in things and not think that it's serious. Uh, we, we have a tendency to put sin on different levels. And when you read in Re Revelation 21.8, you can see that lying is, is mixed in with these other sins that's serious. So all sins are serious, regardless. There's no such thing as a little white lie uh, or different levels of sin. Man has put those uh, levels there, not God. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your wrongdoings have caused a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hit, hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So we do see that sin separates us from God, and like I said, it's the what sent him to the cross. We're just as guilty of sending Jesus to the cross as those were back in the first century. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, tells us that we've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And then we also know in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages, the things that we've earned, the things that we deserve, is, is a separation from God. It's death. <clears throat> we read in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, and, and also in verse 4, that the person who sins is the one who will die. We know that sin is not something that's inherited, even though consequences from sin can be uh, taken on. I mean, if a man is driving and he's drunk and he kills somebody and he goes to prison, his family will suffer the consequences, but they're not going to inherit his sin. So it's things that we do uh, not responsible for the sins of our father or mother or anyone else. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it tells us that uh, Jesus brought uh, our sins. He took up on our sins on his body on the cross. And so we, as we talked about just a second ago, he bore our sins on the cross. Our sins is what sent him there. Mark chapter 15, verse 33 through 34, shows us the severity of that. When he bore our sins, there was that time that brief time on the cross, the six hours that he hung on the cross, and that was the first and only time, but he was separated from the Father because of our sins that he bore on the cross. 
Uh, what is sin? I think it's important as we talk about sin, and I know Derek <coughs> says that it, the subject is to be keeping away from sin or running from it, but it's important for us to see as we go through here the seriousness of sin, that we've all committed it, and what exactly it is. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14, verse 14 and 23 says, I know that I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to the one who thinks something is unclean, to that person it is unclean. The one who doubts is condemned if he eats because he is eating not from faith. <clears throat> he is eating not from faith, and whatever is not from faith, it is sin. So we could see that sin uh, is a violation of our conscience. When we have a violation of our conscience, we sin. Uh, we need to be uh, convicted and assured that what we're doing is right. Now, I can say this. Our conscience can misguide us. If we're not putting God's Word into our minds and hearts, our conscience can misguide us. But we can see through the examples in the Scripture, whether it was back then with the Jews, whether it was pork, that was uh, unlawful for them to eat, or maybe uh, sacrifices in the first century, that they were able to eat from idols, meat from idols that were sacrificed, but it could void somebody's sin. And, and, and even though it was lawful for them to do it, if, if they really truly convicted that it was sinful, and they did it, it was a sin, even though they had a, a legal right to do so. And why do you think that is? Why do you think there was something that was lawful for them to do and they thought it was wrong to do it and they went on and done it anyway that it would be sin then? Why, why do you think that? Anybody got any opinions on that or any thoughts? I personally think it's because if they think that it's wrong and they're, and they're convinced that it's wrong, and they do it anyway, what are they going to do with the things that are, are uh, unlawful? How are they going to treat that any different from the things that, uh, that, that, that are unlawful and, they, and, and that is a sin than the things that they think that's a sin and they're doing them anyway? And so they're gonna, I don't see where they're going to treat those any different. So it, it, it definitely can affect us in that aspect. This passage is teaching us that we must have full persuasion in what we're doing is lawful, otherwise it is an act of sin. And again, the conscience can be, uh, must be educated by the Word of God. The conscience can be misguided if it's not, if it's not uh, using God's Word in, in what is applied to it there. All right, James chapter 4 verse 17 says, For the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him, for him, it is sin. And so we, uh, we've got things there that we know we're, that we should do, that we're supposed to do, and that if we don't do them, it's sin. I know uh, you get into commission. I know a lot of people used to hear about years ago commission and omission sins. And commission sins are things that we're told not to do, that we do, we commit, and it's sin. And then omission is things that we should do that we're not doing but likewise, it is sin. Also, sin is a failure to keep God's commands, and that's for 1 John chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 17. It says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. So this is telling us it's a failure to keep the law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 tells us that everyone who practices sin is also a practice of lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And we see in Romans chapter 4, verse 15, that the law brings about wrath, and when there is no law, there is no violation. So we got the law, and without a law, we can't break it. And so we see there, God, we do know that God has given us a law. We got the law of Christ. We got God's word of things that we should do the things that we must do or not do and things that we should do. And those are sins, it says, if we don't obey. Those who, can, who obey the commands of God are righteous. Uh, 
That's 1 John 5, 17. It says, those who obey the commands of God are righteous, and those who do not obey the commands of the Lord are unrighteous. 1 John 3, 4 that we just read, for sin is a transgression of the law. This discusses a matter positively. Sin is a flagrant breaking or violating the commands of Jehovah. 1 John 5, 17 says all unrighteousness is sin. And this discusses the matter negatively. Sin is a failure to keep or obey the commandments of Jehovah. So we can sin by breaking the law and sin by not obeying the law. Three, if you will, the three avenues to tempt mankind. We got Genesis 3, 6, which we know that uh, when Adam, uh, Eve, was tempted, she saw that the food was, the food was good. She saw that it was a delight to the eyes, and it was make, make one wise. And we see that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, that there's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Sin, all sin, comes from one or a combination of these three things. And we see how that plays out with the deception of, with Eve. James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, for which the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one is to say when he is tempted, I have been, I've been tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when the lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin has run its course, it brings forth death. Guy Woods wrote this, The improper desire has seduced the will and tempted it to submit to impure conduct. From this wicked union, sin is conceived and ultimately born. We see there are three things that cause man to fall. Man heard a lie, man believed a lie, and man obeyed a lie. And we know that to be saved, there's three things that man has to hear the truth, believe the truth, and obey the truth. <clears throat> Some epithets from sin. From the Old Testament, there's three words that we're going to look at, and then we'll look at three words from the New Testament. Um, these are most frequent words used to describe sin. One of them is transgression. Sin is transgression. If you will, if you turn over to uh, Psalms 51, and we'll look at first four verses of that. The Hebrew word there used is peshe. It means a transgression. Transgression or rebellion. It's Psalms 51, verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1 and then verse 3. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. In verse 3 says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. We, hear, we have here contentment. Contentment for the lawmaker. And these two tie together when we have contempt for the law and contempt for the lawmaker. You'll see how these are, are, are woven together because when we, uh, just like today in civil authority, when we know we're breaking the law, we have contempt for the law, but we also know that we have contempt for the lawmakers that gave the law. Psalm 51, verse 2 and verse 5, that sin is an iniquity. It's a perversity. That means a deliberate desire to behave in an, an unreasonable or unacceptable way. It says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, verse 2. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, my, and in sin my mother conceived me. So we see there the contempt for the law or the depravity of conduct. Now this is, some people take this out of context and say, well, let's see, this is where a, a child is born and they're born into sin and this is not what it's talking about. It's talking about being born into a sinful world. Children are innocent. Uh, it's not like Catholicism teaches where they have to christen babies and 
babies are born into sin, they, they do not know what sin is. And so this is, uh, that is not the context here. <clears throat> the next one is, sin is sin, it's missing the mark. And you see that in, in Psalm 51 verse 4. And aven is the, the Hebrew word that's used there for that. And it says, against you, and you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you, may, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. We, <clears throat> we fall short. That's what that means. We fall short. We fall short of God's purpose and, and mark for us. And we'll see some three words now over the New Testament and these three, these three words, it's just like the words in the Old Testament. They're different words, but they're meaning the same things. In the New Testament as with the Old, Old Testament. All right, sin is missing the mark. And you see that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. Uh, verse 34, I'm sorry. Hamartia is the Greek word for that. And it says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak to this, this to your shame. And so then we see again here that we're missing the mark, we're missing the purpose that God has given us the, the, the mark. The, I think about it like shooting an arrow or a gun. You, you're looking and you're focusing on a bullseye to hit the bullseye and you're missing it. And I, that's, that's basically what that's saying. And we're missing, we're missing the mark. We're off. Sin is also transgressing or overpassing a line. And that's Romans chapter 4 verse 15. We must stay on the right side of the line, the line between the truth and error, right and wrong. The church and denominationalism, purity and immorality, spirituality and worldliness. It says because, Romans 4.15 says, Because the law brings about wrath, for the, where, where there is no law, there is no transgression. I know... Sometimes people in their mind uh, have in their mind, how close can I get to doing something that I want to do without actually crossing that line and sinning? And we don't need to play with that. We don't need to see how close we can get uh, before we sin. Let me turn to Romans. I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to look at a few verses here in chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Verse 15, For if by transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abound to many. Verse 17, For if by the transgressions of one death reigned through the, through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through the one, Jesus Christ. So we see sin entered in through Adam, but we see that the, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness come through Jesus Christ. And so... It says, sin is falling where one should have stood. I know you see the, the armor of God. You see one of, the, one of the parts of the armor of God, and we see that through the Word. But one of the parts of the armor of God is the shoes. And I know playing football or baseball, people wear cleats. And they do it so they'll have a good footing. And even in the Romans, they would use spikes or nails to help keep good footing because they didn't want to. They didn't want to slip and fall. And so we need to be sure that we're using God's Word and applying it to our lives and studying it, reading it, and putting it in our hearts and our minds and helping us to stand firm so that we don't lose our footing and fall. 
All right, what will sin do? Sin will separate man from God. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus you were who previously were far off and been brought near by the blood of, of Christ. And we've done seen that through other verses that we see that sin separates us. It does, it, sin, a union and a separation. Separation in the Bible is either spiritual or physical. And a union is, 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 is a, a union is life in the Bible and separation is death. We can have that both ways, either spiritually or physically, but sin uh, spiritually separates us from the Father. It also separates man from his better self. In Galatians 5, verse 17, it says, For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. I know uh, we've seen a lot of the cartoon things where the angel's on one shoulder and the devil's on the other shoulder, and there's a struggle there, uh, a battle there. And so we, we struggle. It's against self. But also, if you read Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21, it says, But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and the waters toss up refuse in mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. We can't have peace. As long as we're sinning and living a life of sin, we can never truly have peace in our lives if we're not doing the thing that God wants us to do. Sin also separates man from family. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, we see here David and Bathsheba, and we know that there was, there was problems. He lost his son because of that. And also chapter 13 tells us about Amnon and... Uh, Tamar, he, 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 he raped his sister, and his brother wound up killing him for it. And so it causes problems, and we see that in a lot of different ways. It causes separation and problems with our family. But sin also separates man from the brethren. When you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you'll see there that there's a gentleman that's part of the, the church there, and he's actually sleeping with his stepmother. And, uh, of course, they're rebuked and, and letting them know they need, to, they need to just fellowship. They need to put him away. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that living faithfully, we have fellowship with one another. So sin does cause us to be separated um, from our fellow brothers and sisters. It also separates man at the judgment day. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. It also will disgrace a nation. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. I look at our nation today and I wonder how many nations are, are laughing at us for the things that we're, we're leaning toward and the way our nation's going and things that we're supporting today that are sinful and against God. It will also disgrace a community or a city. Jude chapter 7, we see Solomon and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Since, since they, in the same way as the angels, indulged in sexual perversion and went after strange flesh or exhibited as an example of, of undergoing the punishment of eternal fire, and we know what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed it. It also disgraced one's family. Proverbs 28, 7 says, He who keeps the law is, discern, is a discerning son, but he who is a companion of gluttons humiliates his father. It disgraces the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 is an example of that, where we see that sexual immorality. And he says not even those things is, is done among the Gentiles. And that's one of the reasons why when we, when we, have, we have sinned publicly and brought shame to the church, 
then we, we should make a public confession and ask for forgiveness. Because if I've sinned publicly and brought shame against the church, I brought shame not only to God's kingdom, but also to my fellow brothers and sisters. <clears throat> it's to great disgrace the individual. Proverbs 6, 32 through 33 says, One who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense, but he who would destroy himself commits it. He who finds wounds and disgrace and his shame will not be removed. We see, we see this so much in Hollywood. That it's like these movie stars have no, no shame about themselves. That's where it goes back to what we were just talking about in Matthew chapter 5 about cutting the hand off if it causes you to sin and, and it's going to lead you to hell or plucking your eye out. Besetting sin. So that's a sin that's that, the sins that closely clings to us. Uh, it's analogy like the, uh, back in Rome or the Olympians, uh, back in the ancient days, uh, they would take off any garments that they had so it would not impede or hinder them uh, and cause them to stumble. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we have had such a great cloud of witness surrounding us, let us rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Their sins can be people or whatever it is in our lives that we have weaknesses. And if we let them cling to us and let them stay close to us, whatever it is, it makes it easy for us to commit those sins, and we need to put those things off and get those things uh, out of our lives. Something I want to touch on right quick. I know we got 15, looks like about 15 minutes, but I want to touch on <clears throat> improper attitudes. This is on your other sheet, and then we'll, we got time, we'll jump back to the, the, to, uh, to the other sheet. So improper attitudes towards sin. Deny it. That's an improper attitude. We've learned, we've seen, we know sin's real. Hell's real. Satan's real. I know the Christian science, scientists, they, they teach that evil is nothing. They have some really weird, really weird teachings. I don't know how in the world they convince themselves to follow some of this stuff. But we do know, and we're not to deny it. It's real and it's serious. To mock it. get to my sheet where I've got my, my, my scriptures printed out so I don't have to keep flipping pages. <clears throat> Proverbs 14.9 says, Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is good will. And that's laughing and making fun of jokes. Dirty jokes, movies, or things that we find humorous uh, and make a mock of it. We're not to participate in those kind of things or have that attitude. To love it. Now, we know there's things that's sinful that the fleshly desires are that they indulge and enjoy it, but we're not to love it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 and 12 says, And with all deception and wickedness for those who perish, because they did not accept the love of the truth so as to be saved, for this reason God will send upon them a, a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth and took pleasure in wickedness. To minimize it, I use an example here, it's a little white lie. I know today it seems to be the culture of people living together and they say that's my partner. They, they, they don't use the word shacking up like we used to use. Uh, they want to kind of smooth it over, and uh, it could be same sex. That's my partner, uh, and you'll see that when, uh, even though I know that uh, same sex marriage, that uh, you'll hear that word, my partner. I'll say this: God's word supersedes man's word, uh, law. God's law supersedes man's law. We're to obey man's law until it violates God's law. But you see in the world today, uh, man has accepted things. Same-sex marriage is an example. 
uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Man, man's law gives uh, the right to uh, divorce and remarry, contradictory to God's word. Also to d dismiss it, overlook it, and that's what was happening in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, they were puffed up. It was almost like, the, uh, I guess like you could say, they were the kind of were boastful about it. Hey, we love everybody. You know, we, we're not uh, being judgmental. And that's one of the things that a lot of people take out of, out of context, the word that says, uh, do not judge for the way you be judged. And that's talking about with compassion and mercy. It's not talking about us not being able to use God's word. God's word is the one that has judged. We're to use it to rebuke and correct things that are wrong. Proper attitudes towards sin. We're to confess our sins. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, One who conceals his wrongdoings will not prosper, but the one who confesses and abandons them will find compassion. We also see this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 10, where it tells us to confess our sins. We're to hate it. Proverbs 8, 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. We're to shun it. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And sexual immorality don't happen by accident. It's a thought process. Romans 12, 9 tells us to hoard from it, to shrink from it, draw from it. Also, resist it. James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the last one I got on there is expose it. Luke 20, verse 45 through 47 says, And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, Beware the scribes who, walk, who like to walk around in long robes and love personal greetings in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. Devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive all the more condemnation. And we also see Jesus doing that a number of times, like a woman at the well. He exposes sin. So what can we do about sin? We know. We know what the Scripture says in John 3.16 and, and John 8.24 that we have to believe. We have to believe that uh, uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have to believe God's Word is the truth. We have to be willing to confess, as Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33 says. It's not just a one and done deal. It's not just uh, confessing Jesus at the time we're, we're baptized, but to be willing to confess him through our life. And also Romans chapter 3, verse 6 through five, 3 through 5, we have to be able to repent. Some people... Uh, I know when you do Bible studies, you, you'll be surprised at the number of people who do not understand what repentance is. Uh, a lot of people's definition of repentance is asking for forgiveness. It's not. If you'll turn to uh, 2 Corinthians, verse 7. We're going to look at verse 8 and 10, 8 through 10. It says, Though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, but though for only a while. I now rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but you, you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. I know, Derek, I think you touched on that the other day. Uh, and we see this over in Acts chapter 37, where they were pierced to the heart once they had been told that they had just crucified God's Son and nailed Him to the cross. They were pierced to the heart, so they had godly sorrow. And godly sorrow moves us to repent, to want to change our life, to do the things that God wants us to do. But it's just a step. It's not salvation. It says here, 
that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for that for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God in order that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So there's a difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is we know that we sinned, we've hurt God, it separates us from God, it causes us to change, to produce repentance, which is a step toward salvation. Uh, worldly sorrow is just getting caught for doing something that you did wrong. And then we see also, of course, that we have to be baptized. Uh, Galatians 3.27 tells us that we're baptized to put on Christ in baptism. I look at salvation kind of like a road map. I know when we travel to Orlando uh, or any other parts, you know, if you're on your destination and going, you ask how far you are along that path, and you'll get different answers at different times. And it's the same way with salvation. When a person hears, uh, then they're able to believe, but they're not at that same stage yet. It will then cause them to want to have hopefully have godly sorrow cause them to repent and change. They're still not saved at that point until they're baptized, and that's the end of the road map there, that final destination as far as being saved. But they have to continue to be faithful and obey God. So what happens after a person is, uh, is saved then? We know 1 John 1, 9 and James 5, 16 tells us that we have to confess our sins. We have to be willing to Turn from those sins that we've committed once we've got come into the contact with the blood, and then we are, are able to confess those sins and ask God to forgive us. Luke 9, 23 tells us to carry a cross daily, and that's telling us to, that we have to die to self. We have to die each and every day to our own selfish desires to live the way that God wants. And, of course, 2 Peter 3, 7 tells us that there's a judgment day coming. I wrote down Mark 8, 36, and, of course, we know that what does a man profit if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? You know, you think about it. If a person is in a lost state, each and every day, each and every minute that goes by, it's just like them, in analogy, going to the boat. How many of us would go to the boat and actually put our soul, if it was possible, and gamble with our, with our soul at the boat. I don't think none of us would. But that's what a person does each and every day, each and every minute, that they have not obeyed the gospel, or that they have not got, gotten their life back right with God, and repented, and come to, back to Him if they're out of fellowship with Him. They're taking a chance that they're giving more time in order to, to get right. And that's a big gamble. If you will turn, I know we got, I think, about seven minutes. Uh, and I didn't know if I was going to have time to get to this part or not. But if you will, if you go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5. And we'll just look at a few different things dealing with sin. Um, It says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. There, there are sins that's evident that you can plainly see. Uh, but there's some sins that are not evident. I mean, we got attitudes, feelings, thoughts, things like that. They're not as, as evident as these, but these are evident to us. And it says, it says this, which is immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, Strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, which can include illegal drugs. People say, well, drugs is not included. Well, it says things like these. It does. It includes those. It says, just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I kind of went down through the list there. Uh, Fornication or sexual immorality, that's where we get the word pornea. That can be any kind of sexual act. 
Uh, adultery, we know, is specifically with a married person. It can be with two married people, it can be with one married person and another person who's not married, uh, but, but fornication with any kind of sexual uh, act. Impurity, in uncleanness. Some of these words, that, the reason I'm going through here looking at this is because some of these words, when we go down through there and look at the ones I read, a lot of these words we don't even use each and every day. Some of them we know, but stuff like factions and dissensions, we don't usually use those words. So anyway, impurity, uncleanness, unclean in the deeds, words, and thoughts, and desires of the heart, lasciviousness, some translations use the word lewdness, or sensuality, debauchery, indecent body movements, inappropriate touching, no self-control, no shame about it. We see that today. Uh, I can think of a movie star, Miley Cyrus, comes to my mind. She is, she's not shameful at all for things she does. Um, Lady Gaga is another one that pops off my mind real quick. It's like they have no shame about themselves. Idolatry, we know what that means, but it doesn't mean just worship of idols. It could be anything. Anything that we're putting before God is idolatry. It could be our jobs. It could be our hobbies. It could be people. It could be money. Anything that we're putting before God is idolatry. Witchcraft, sorcery. That's where we get the word pharmaca, or what do we get the word pharmacy? Because uh, it, it did. It included uh, altering drugs, mind-altering drugs and uh, spells and things like that. Hatred is enmities, hostile, hostile to others, ill will toward others. Variance is strife or contention, arguing, quarreling, having wrangling disputes. Emulations is jealousy. I, I looked at that and I was trying to figure out well, what's the difference in jealousy and envying? And maybe some of y'all can help me a little bit on that. But it seemed, it seemed like jealousy was more toward the things like bitterness and hostility and resentment. And envying was more toward things like, well, I envy uh, what this person's got, having ill will because of what this person has or what this person does or who they are. And so there, there, is, there is a difference between the two. Wrath, outburst of anger, uncontrollable temper, fits of rage. Seditions, discord, showing, uh, having dissensions or divisions, moving apart and following in different directions like following different leaders, different teachings, heresies or factions, self-seeking, self-will groups that work and scheme against each other. Divisions from opinions and against envyings which is looking at ill will toward others or what another has or who, who they are. Envy wants to deprive the other person of what they have and jealousy, of, uh, <clears throat> like I said, it seems to have more of the emotional parts. Revelings, carousings, uh, partying, going out, tearing the streets up as the old saying used to go thing that comes to my mind, Mardi Gras. That's one of the first things that comes to my mind on that. And of course, it says drunkenness, um, being intoxicated, banqueting, drinking parties. That does not mean that they have to just be literally drunk to where they stagger and can't stand up. It means being intoxicated. As we've seen here, and I know we all know that it's a very serious thing, sin. And I know, like I said before, Revelation 21.8, it, it, it throws lying in with some other sins that we look at. And as man would say, oh, those are really bad. So let's all think, me included, we all have struggles. And I'm going to tell you, Satan's had a lot of time to work and know our weaknesses and a way to deceive. And he does each and every day, and he works, probably works on us harder than he does people who are not saved, I'm quite sure. So this all just things that we've read, but just something to help refresh our minds, help us to refocus and really understand, you know, 
This stuff is serious. Thankfully, we've got the grace and the blood of Christ that can that wash our sins away. I appreciate y'all. Thank you very much.